Hello, and welcome to Community Conversations, the show that's for and about the people who live in Reading. My name is Kevin Bent, and I'm going to be your host for this episode. And this is an episode that's going to deal with fine arts in Reading. We're going to be talking with George Ogata, who is the new musical director for the Reading Symphony Orchestra. But first, we have the stars of the new Colonial Chorus Players show, The Odd Couple, in studio. Let's listen in on that conversation now. Well, hello, and welcome back to Community Conversation. I'm here today with some representatives of the Colonial Chorus Players. They have uh, Heather Hamilton and Angela Merrill. Welcome. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's great to have you here today, and I know you are excited because you're working on something different this time for Colonial Chorus Players, something that's never been done before. Yes, we are doing a fundraiser for Colonial Chorus, and it's the first time Colonial Chorus has ever done a play. So not a musical, but, but, but a play. Yes. And that yes. play is a famous one, Neil Simon, and it is the... The Odd Couple. The Odd Couple, <laughs> yeah. but it's... Yeah, but it's the, <laughs> But it's the odd couple with a twist. And what is that twist? Um, well, instead of having Felix and Oscar, we actually have Florence and Olive. So it's the female version of the odd the couple. The female version of the odd couple, yes, not yes. the male <laughs> version. Okay. So I know you and you're not aren't necessarily familiar, but what are some of the ways that the a female version is different from the male version of the odd couple? Uh, the big thing, and it actually annoys us a little <laughs> bit, is instead of them playing poker, instead of the guys who play poker okay. every Friday night, the ladies play Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> and us being ladies, you know, of today versus the 80s, we're a little annoyed that they Neil Simon couldn't have kept it as them still playing poker to okay. yeah. play a round of Trivial Pursuit. But but it, I mean, it's hardcore Trivial yeah, Pursuit. Yeah, we, sure. we take it very seriously. It's cutthroat. Oh, absolutely. Well, it has to be cutthroat <laughs> to fit the poker in the actual yeah, play. Of course. So give us a brief synopsis of what the play is about, uh, for those who may not be familiar with it. Um, so basically what's happening is every Friday night, the girls, so there's a Florence and Olive, and they've got their, their four buddies there, uh, Sylvie, Vera, Renee, and Mickey. Um, and they have their cutthroat game of Trivial Pursuit every night, <laughs> hanging out ladies' night. Um, and Florence ends up... <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, Florence finds herself in the middle of a pretty nasty breakup with her husband, Sydney, and okay. they've been married for 14 years, and her antics have basically pushed him over the edge, and he finally says, enough, I'm done. And she basically shows up in hysterics to mm -hmm. the um, weekly Trivial Pursuit game. <laughs> and everybody's figuring out what to do, and no one really knows. And eventually, Olive decides she's going to take Florence in, take her in as a roommate, sort of give her her own place for a little while. And it just all goes to chaos <laughs> after that, <That's laughs> as, right. as people will see. Because, yeah. because the, the personalities don't necessarily mix and match, even right. though they're friends. Yes. Exactly. What are some of the quirks that uh, Florence may have oh. that, that <laughs> drove her husband away? Oh, hmm, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, she's very, very clean, very particular about having things you know, her way in order, very meticulous about you know, cleanliness, punctuality, just to name a few things that also end up um, coming between them in the show. She's also so much so to that point of almost OCD that it affects everyone around her and everyone in the okay. room and it sort of overpowers any other personality traits she may have because she's so obsessive about you know things being in sure. order, things being perfect and that includes her own image as well right. as the environment around her. And then how does that contrast with all of them? They are absolutely polar opposites. There is nothing similar about the two of them. Olive is loud, she's obnoxious, she serves, you know, old cheese and meat for her sandwiches <laughs> at the Trivial Pursuit night. She doesn't pay attention to, you know, the expiration dates on anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's all about sports and what's going right. on in the world of sports. She's actually a, a very, a, professional woman she runs um, uh, a news show okay. so you know she's behind the scenes of the news so when she's at work she loves to she can take control but when she comes home she just everything she wants to flop she doesn't pay <laughs> attention to where anything is right. yeah. so the the contrast between the two of them starts off not so bad uh, but it quickly deteriorates into absolute chaos it's funny you mentioned that olive is very much a career woman very much like a new age woman whereas florence is sort of stuck in the 1950s okay. which you know she's a homemaker and mm -hmm. that's her life that's what she knows and then she's sort of i think in awe of olive that she you know she goes out and she goes to work and she makes her own money and but yeah that's 
just another area where they clash. Sure. Now, before people get the wrong idea about, about the odd couple, it is actually a comedy. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> so yeah. it's not, you know, full of all this other kind of no. stuff. Give yeah. us an uh, idea of maybe one or two really funny scenes that happen oh, in the play without goodness. giving too much away. Oh, uh, well, you know, in true Neil Simon fashion, there always has to be something going on in the bathroom. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> Big, so big there's, there's yeah. definitely there's Absolutely. definitely some fun things going on in the bathroom, um, and I you know we've got a couple of Spanish brothers that live in the apartment building okay. and um, shake things up a bit. Yeah, they yeah. absolutely do. All right. <laughs> All right. So how do you go about um, preparing to play a role that may be different from the way your actual you know personal character is? <laughs> Maybe Heather, you can start us off. What, what do you do to kind of prepare to be? Well, to be I definitely Florence? think um, I change the way I move. Like the way Florence moves, she's very flighty, very like almost robotic in a way. Like she's very restrained and self-controlled. So when she moves, it's almost like like a little sandpiper running on the beach. Like okay. it's very like ah, 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 you know, and you know, very much about careful and gentle and almost it's it's strange. She's almost like a caricature, mm. and I think that definitely affects how I how I prepare, I sort sure. of try to move like her. And even when I speak, it's very like, ah, 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 like almost like singing, <laughs> you know, and it's so different than I think the way Angela plays Olive, like, you know, and again, they're polar opposites, you know, right. I'm trying to avoid conflict at all costs and Olive just wants to fight, you know, if we're gonna fight, let's fight. And, right. you know, Florence is not about that. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely in the way I move and I think in the way I speak, mm -hmm. I, I try to change that when I'm playing Florence. Sure, and same uh, to you, Angela. How do you prepare to play a character like Olive, kind of devil may care kind of person? Um, always one of the first things I think about when I'm playing a character is um, who they are and how that different is different for me and also how it's similar for me. So okay. what can I use that I already have as me mm -hmm. so that that can be an easier transition and then so that I can focus on the more difficult things. So there's um, the, the big thing with Olive, yes, I, I am a loud person but Olive is not only loud, she's very gruff. So there's this, um, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of work that I'm, I'm really trying to focus on with my voice so that it's okay. not Angela's voice, that there's a gruffer right. um, voice. So that's been a, a big thing that for this particular role that I've been focusing on a lot. Um, and again, and, and physical is a big thing because yes. we have to mm -hmm. show the different the difference in our physicality with each other. She's prim proper, <laughs> um, and there's a lot of all of this very exactly. flops. Yeah. There's okay. no, you know, there's even no in just the way process. we sit. The way we sit at the at the Trivial Pursuit table is very, very different. You know, it's just like, uh, right. and then she's just like, there's a lot <laughs> of you know, like you <laughs> yeah. know, the arm of the couch versus right. getting down. You know, Florence sure. would be sitting very, very yeah, pretty on the couch, the lap, kind of like where I would be leaning <laughs> on the arm of the couch. Sure. I, you know flop over with one leg hang you know there's <laughs> there's a very yeah so there's there's a lot of things that we have to you almost have to disregard of how you normally are and be like no this is okay that's all right i am supposed to do this i'm i'm a woman right. but it's okay yeah. for, my that's right, for the character <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you just tell everybody in the audience this isn't really yeah. me put an asterisk <laughs> next to the character list just this is okay be aware right. if you're in the front row uh, <laughs> good tip sure audience good tip. Is only. good tip so um how did you go about uh, auditioning for the role and getting the roles that you got and all that? Because obviously, you know, the play really rides on these two characters mm -hmm. being successful. So kind of how did that come about? We actually uh, lucked out. We auditioned the same night together yeah. and actually got to play a lot of scenes together. Oh, okay. Me as Olive um, and Heather as Florence. So that was actually uh, kind of fun. So clearly yeah. there was something about the two of us that... Uh, Some chemistry. That, yeah. <laughs> I was so excited, something. actually, when I found out that Angela was cast as, all, as Olive because I remembered reading with her at audition and I was like, oh, she's really good. Like, she would be such a good Olive. <laughs> and then, you know, come lo and behold, she is Olive. And I'm like, yes, perfect. Because right. like, I had so much fun reading with her. And this is actually um, my first production um, okay. with CCP. And I found out about them on their website, on, you know, a few different, like, local community theater websites. Mm -hmm. And I decided, oh, well, let's just see what happens. I, sure. I've been, always enjoyed theater as a hobby. I'm like, well, you know, let's try this out. And I almost actually did an audition because I thought the age demographic was uh, was um, not quite where I was. Okay. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I should, but you know, I ended up just going for it. Worst that can happen is I'm not cast. And then they're like, um, hi, we want you to be Florence. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess that went pretty well. <laughs> so yeah. it ended up working out. But um, I, in the past, I've actually done some theater at UMass Lowell with okay. the off-Broadway players and um, right. really enjoyed doing some theater there. I just wanted to 
do some more. So Excellent. found them, Excellent. and I'm really, really happy well, that I did. Well, that's yeah. excited. I know you've done several plays with CCP. Yes. What are one or two plays you've done with CCP? Um, the, probably the most recent um, was You're in Town, um, and before that, I think, was maybe Curtains. Okay. I'm um, trying to, you know, I've produced, been in. Sure trying to remember yeah <laughs> well that's excellent so just kind of uh, to let the audience know it's the odd couple the female version of the odd couple right. when is it happening and where um, so the first weekend is Columbus Day weekend so okay. October 9th 10th and 11th <laughs> and also then the following weekend the 16th 17th and 18th okay the Friday and Saturday night shows are at 730 and the matinees sure. are at 2 and it's at the old hose house here in town okay. um, right on route 28 uh, 1249 Main Street and right. uh, you know they can get all the information that they need on our website, which and is what just is the website? ccp1961.org. Okay, and tickets are available through the website. Absolutely, and yes. Okay. Yes, all and the all the box office information is right there on the website. And yeah. the proceeds are going to help support the community theater group in town, which is a colonial course. Yes, and mm -hmm. one of the things that we're working on right now is to build an actual theater space within oh, that okay. space. So we're hoping that yeah. this um, will help to fund we'll, we'll that. Help go towards yes. that. Excellent. Well, I thank you for coming on the show today and sharing a little bit about The Odd Couple. We didn't want to share too much so <laughs> right. that when we go see the show, exactly. we'll be able to uh, be surprised and, and uh, enjoy it just as much. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Heather, for being here. And I do encourage people out there, if you're interested or just want to help out, to check out the website ccp1962.org. 61. 61.org. <laughs> ccp 1961. Don't want to go to 1962.org. No, no, no we kidding. don't like those people at all. <laughs> ccp1961.org. You've been watching Community Conversation on RCTV. We'll be right back in just a moment. Hello and welcome back to Community Conversation. Now let's listen in on a conversation with George Ogata, the director of the Reading Symphony Orchestra. Hello, I am here with George Ogata. George is the musical director of the Reading Symphony Orchestra. Welcome, George. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it's it. It's good to have you here today. Now you started with the Reading Symphony Orchestra when? I started last year in October of 2014. Okay, so you're in your second season. Second season. With the uh, RSO. What can we look forward to coming up here with the Reading Symphony Orchestra? Well, we have three concerts planned for this particular season. It's mm -hmm. the 83rd season wow. of the Reading Symphony Orchestra. Wow. Uh, the first concert is going to be on November 22nd. Okay. Uh, the second concert is going to be on May 20th. And our final concert is going to be on May 22nd. It's going to be our Pops concert where we're going to feature okay. dance themes. Oh. For the first concert, we have quite a thrilling list of pieces. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with an old uh, hall favorite of the Overture to Oberon by Carl Maria von Weber. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're going to do the Dvorak Cello Concerto, a beloved cello concerto yeah, okay. featuring the uh, the principal of the Handel and Haydn Society. His name okay. is Guy Fishman. All right. And um, the final concert, so final piece will be Brahms Symphony Number no. One in C minor. Wow! So that sounds like a lot of good stuff coming up here pretty soon. Can you tell us kind of how you uh, came to be the music director of the RSO. So there was a, uh, a quite a, a music sorry, music director search, okay. uh, for, which lasted about two years to find mm. the 
the next music director sure. of the Reading Symphony Orchestra. There were several candidates. Um, I, I found out about the Reading Symphony because I'm actually a resident of Wakefield in oh, okay. the neighboring Wakefield. Sure. And uh, I applied and uh -huh. was, was very hopeful and went through the rounds. The sure. final round was actually, the finals uh, was a, an opportunity to work with the orchestra in mm -hmm. three rehearsal centers. Oh, okay, all right. And after so, that, I got the fateful phone call <laughs> uh, where I found out that I was the new music director. And so conductor. really some, some hands-on uh, opportunity to kind of show your stuff there with the whole orchestra. Right, right. So what is a little bit of your background? What, have you, what did you do to reach this point? Sure. Um, I am currently the conductor of the uh, MIT Summer Philharmonic Orchestra. Okay. It's a community orchestra based in, in the summer months at MIT, mm -hmm. um, where I was actually a long time ago an undergraduate. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, this is an ensemble that has been in existence for 19 years. Okay. That's where I really developed my my uh, conducting career. Uh, mm -hmm. On uh, alongside the MIT Summer Philharmonic. Uh, I was on the faculty at the Laundry School of Music, oh, where yeah. I was conductor of their senior youth orchestra for mm -hmm. uh, uh, 17 years, actually. Okay, okay, wow. And so um, those two angles uh, really led me to this mm -hmm. particular junction with the Reading Symphony. So what do you find is the most challenging part about being the music director for even a local symphony orchestra like the one we, are, we have here in Reading? Well, they say that uh, only 1% of conducting is actually conducting. <laughs> There's a lot of work that goes into it. Mm -hmm. First of all, the preparation of uh, the, the study, studying of the music beforehand. Sure, sure. Um, you have to select the music. You have mm -hmm. to get to know the musicians themselves. You okay. have to really gel with their personalities. Um, so preparing for the rehearsals is one big aspect. Right. Uh, preparing for the concert itself is mm -hmm. yet another track, making sure that the, the concerts are, are advertised for properly, that we get the m right marketing into sure. the Reading space, right. uh, uh, making sure that we have the, the, the concert hall all ready and the tickets all sold. Right. So right. there's a lot of work that right. goes on. So explain yeah. to me the process of choosing a musical piece that you're going to feature in a concert. How, I mean, obviously there's mm -hmm. a... I won't say infinite, but almost infinite amount of music you could choose from. How do you go about the process of choosing what music is going to appear in a concert? Well, first of all, um, I want to make sure that it's fun for the, the musicians themselves okay. to play. Right. And being having been a violinist in the past and having been in several community orchestras myself, mm -hmm. I, I, I have a radar for what works well for for musicians. Right. Um, in addition, um, you know, I'm thinking about the entire year as well. What kind of pieces am I mm -hmm. programming so that I give not only the orchestra members a, a good variety, yep. but also the audience the goers audience, sure. as well. Uh, this year in particular, we have uh, you know quite an interesting uh, set of pieces that relate to one another. First of all, we're doing Brahms Symphony Number no. 1. Mm -hmm. uh, it was his first symphony that he wrote, and he came to it rather late. Uh, he, he finalized the, the piece in, at age 42. Okay. Um, it had a, a 14 to 21 year gestation period, actually. Sure. Um, and in it, it's really an homage to Beethoven. You'll see mm -hmm. uh, in the last movement kind of a similar theme to Beethoven's uh, ninth, the Ode to Joy theme. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the first movement, you'll hear a uh, very much echoes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which mm -hmm. with the fate motive. Yeah. Um, and because I chose Brahms Symphony Number no. One, yeah. I decided to program Beethoven's Symphony Number no. Five, the, the most a, famous piece in the world, sure. as a uh, companion piece. As a companion piece. So sure. to try to tie throughout the the season uh, uh, certain uh, similarities. Okay. Um, I also take into account the soloists that that we're we're featuring and. The one thing that I've been um, establishing with this orchestra is to mm -hmm. invite high caliber, really well-known musical personalities in the area mm -hmm. to really uh, showcase them and also to, to um, have the, uh, the orchestra members exposed and also the audience members exposed to really sure. great people. Great people, great musicians right. inspire. Yeah, I've and for example, last uh, year um, we featured Halden Martinson, who mm -hmm. is the principal second violin of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Sure. And this year, it's Guy Fishman. He's the principal right. of the Handel and Haydn Society. So yeah. we want to bring these fresh faces to the, the public. Of, and I would of think, Reading. as you said, that really inspires the musicians that are in the orchestra now to not only want to play their best, but also to kind of... Uh, 
aspire to be a little better than they actually are um, in in real life because they see they see this great musician and so I think that that is a really terrific thing for you to bring in a guest soloist or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. That when way. when Halden came, mm -hmm. uh, the the principal second violin of the Boston Symphony, um, everyone was just raving in in the orchestra itself, saying that this person is it was uh, playing at such a high caliber. Sure. Uh, I only heard great feedback from the orchestra, the audience members themselves, right. okay. that they were witness to sure. such greatness. Sure, sure. So if someone were interested in participating in the orchestra or joining the orchestra, how would they go about doing that? Well, they can definitely contact me. Um, there is also a personnel manager that they can contact. Okay. We have a website, uh, www reddingsymphonyorchestra.org. Okay, the whole, the whole phrase. You bet, the whole, <laughs> whole, whole phrase. And uh, on it, we have information about how people can, can join us. Okay. And I encourage people to really inquire sure. about uh, uh, becoming a part of our team. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it both, not, not only a family, but a, a team. Um, okay. One thing that I'm really stressing this particular year is, is culture. Okay. And, and for me, um, uh, a great product, great music, a great experience comes from culture. And mm -hmm. so one thing that I'm really trying to establish this particular year is, is the culture of the Reading Symphony Orchestra. Uh, okay. I, I want to set you know, uh, expectations and a tone of, of, um, uh, uh, of greatness within the orchestra, that we're not just a, a good orchestra. We're not sure. just making music. We're making great music. Yeah. And yeah. and in order to fulfill that culture, we want people out there sure. that that want to be a part of that. Yeah. And so I, I absolutely encourage people to inquire. Any particular instruments you may be looking for for this season or, or towards the end of the year that people might, if they played, could could try out for any particular ones or really anybody? Well, <laughs> really anybody. Um, we we do have. Uh, first of all, we do have a lot of returning members, so sure. there might be certain instruments, sure. uh, for example, within the woodwind section where there are so few seats that we may not need right. at this point, but you know we can always put them on the list. Right. Um, strings, we, we, we always welcome uh, uh, more um, at, at any given time. Sure, sure. And so if someone were interested, they go to your website to check it out. Is there, is there an audition process, or how, how does that work? Sure, there is an audition pro process for, for every person that comes into the orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's, it's a, get, getting a sense of how the person plays, mm -hmm. how that person can contribute to the, the orchestral fabric, sure. And, sure. And, and how that they can contribute uh, uh, to, so that, that when they join, they are augmenting our, our family. Right, right. Well, that sounds... Uh Terrific, actually. It yeah. sounds like it would be a lot of fun. And I like the fact that you kind of emphasize what I'll call the community aspect of being in the orchestra. There's not just a bunch of people who come together and uh, play instruments together, but there's actually a family or a team there. And I think that's a real important piece. And I, I think that would be uh, appreciated by people who, who participate in the orchestra. I don't know if you found that to be true or you're kind of still working on that and developing Well, ab absolutely. I mean, f for me, it's, um, it has to, people are volunteering their time. Right to be in this orchestra. They don't have to be there. So for me, my personal mission is to make it as fun mm -hmm. and engaging as possible. Sure. So I always say energy begets energy. If, if, if I don't, if I stand up in, on the podium in front of the orchestra and, and conduct like a, a, a fish uh, or, 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 or a very uh, tired person, the, the orchestra members are only going to react right. so far. Whereas if I give that energy, my, my, my two billion percent, mm -hmm. uh, every rehearsal and at the concerts, the, the orchestra members themselves, they will react accordingly. Right. So making it fun is important. I want to make it a social experience for them mm -hmm. uh, as well so that, that they get to know one another. Right. Uh, I, I always think that, that people who know each other, that get along with each other, will play music that much better. Together better, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and when people start really uh, making music together, they, they start creating excellence. And then that excellence is contagious, not only within the orchestra, but within the community. Mm -hmm. And then more people want to come and join us. I would think also, as you show enthusiasm about the material itself, you know, you, you chose these particular pieces. Mm -hmm. As you show enthusiasm about that material, that enthusiasm just kind of becomes part of the culture of, of the organization as well, certainly of the, of the performers. Um, Absolutely. Um, I, I, will, I will confess one thing. I, I love music. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, actually, my violin teacher, 
um, who, uh, who was Robert Koff. He was uh, the second violin founding member of the Juilliard String Quartet. Okay. And uh, he pulled me aside one day and he said, George, I have never met anyone that loves music as much as you do. <laughs> and and I, I, that was the biggest compliment sure. he ever paid. But uh, I, I will tell you, um, uh, when it comes to, to classical music, I'm inspired and I want to channel that particular energy into all of the players with whom I work. Okay. So remind us again of the concert dates this year. You said yep. November 20... November 22nd. 22nd. Yep. And then two in May. Right. Uh, there's one, one in March. Well, one March, March 20th. March 20th. Um, and, then and then May 22nd. They're right. all on Sundays. Okay. They all start at 3.30 p.m. And where are those? And they, they are happen? all at the Reading Memorial High School. Okay. And if anyone uh, is interested in joining the orchestra or is interested in getting tickets for the performances, they can go to your website yep. at uh, ReadingSymphonyOrchestra.org. Dot dot org. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank George for being here today. I thank you for sharing a little bit. And your enthusiasm is obvious for what you're doing, and that's really terrific. So we thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of the Reading community as we learn to appreciate music a little bit more. You've been watching Community Conversation on RCTV. We'll be back in just one moment. Well, that's it for this episode of Community Conversation. Thank you to George Ogata and to the actresses who are starring in The Odd Couple, being put on by the Colonial Chorus players. And thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next time to Community Conversation. Approaching from Low Street, I'm easily confused. The bright lights and the traffic are calling me to you. Reaching